This is day 44 of my six mark challenge for AQA GCC science. In the run up to the exams, each day from Monday to Saturday, I'm posting a new video with a six mark question so that you can use these as part of your revision. There's a link in the description below to all of this week's questions and also the playlist containing all of the videos in the series so far. Before you start writing your answer to this question, I just want to remind you that much as it may look like it, and even though you'll probably get a whole sheet of A4 to answer, this is not an essay question. There aren't any marks at all in GCC science for answering in paragraphs or even in full sentences. So just don't do it. You do need to lay out your ideas in a logical order, but actually that's often easier to do if you're answering in the form of bullet points or particularly for a method like this, a numbered list, because that allows you to say repeat these steps without it being really unclear what you're trying to achieve. So answering in bullet points or a numbered list is going to help you to keep your instructions brief and make it really easy easy for your examiner to follow. Now, if you haven't done so already, pause the video and give yourself six minutes to answer this six mark question. When you're writing a method for one of the required practicals, or in fact for any practical activity, it's a really good idea before you get started to explicitly identify what your three variables are. Because in order for us to get into that level three and get five or six marks, you need to write a method that will produce valid data. And your method won't produce valid data unless you have changed your independent variable, measured your dependent variable and controlled your control variables and keeping them the same. So if you've gone through and explicitly identified to yourself what they are before you get started, then that's going to help to remind you that you need to include those things. And it's going to make it much easier for you when you're checking back at the end of the exam to make sure you have actually done it, because it's really easy to describe the whole method, particularly if it's a more complicated one, and then forget to say, now do it again and change the independent variable and so on. So here, our independent variable is the thing that we're changing. It's those different masses of magnesium. And then the dependent variable, the thing we're looking at to see, well, how does the independent variable affect it, is going to be the temperature change. Now, of course, you can't measure that directly. So what we need to do is take the end temperature and subtract the starting temperature to see what the difference between those two numbers is. And then for control variables, I'm going to want to talk about the volume and the concentration of this copper sulfate solution. You could also get into the idea of the magnesium needing to have the same surface area. Um, so if you're using powder, you're always using the same kind of powder. Or if you're using a piece of magnesium ribbon, it's always um, the same diameter of ribbon so that you're not sort of influencing it that way. But to be honest, if you've talked about the copper sulfate, then that's probably as much detail as you need. We don't need three different control variables in here. So as I said, I would always write a method in the form of a numbered list because it means that you can say repeat steps one to five. And that's just a lot clearer than trying to explain what you want them to repeat. So we would start out and we're going to measure 10 centimetres cubed of copper sulfate solution using a measuring cylinder. So I've named my equipment, which I always want to do if I can. You don't always have to, but it's a good idea to do it if you can. And although I've given a number there, you don't need that precise number. So if you said 20 centimetres cubed or five centimetres cubed, that's fine. Or even if you just said measure a set volume, it's just that if you've put down a number, it's a lot easier to then say, do it again using 10 centimetres cubed than it is to explain that you need to be using the exact same volume. So it's just a time saving thing there. Then I need to take the temperature of that using my thermometer. Now, if you've missed out that step, you could still get valid data provided your range of masses of magnesium is big enough. So if we're looking at 0.2 grams of magnesium and one gram of magnesium, then it's unlikely that the starting temperature is going to have moved enough to hide the difference in the final temperatures. But to get the best valid data, we do want to be working from the starting point, And that's actually saying how much has it changed. So then I'm going to measure out my 0.2 grams of magnesium powder using a balance. Again, it's not important that it's 0.2 grams. If you started with one gram, that's fine. It's just faster to write down numbers rather than talk about do it again with different masses of magnesium. Then we're going to add that magnesium to the copper sulfate, because, of course, if we haven't added them together, no displacement reaction is going to take place. And we're going to continuously monitor that temperature and record what the highest value is. Now, you might not have identified that this is an exothermic reaction because it's a displacement reaction. So if you've just said until the temperature stops changing, that's absolutely fine. Then we're going to calculate what the temperature change is. And I probably should have put in here how we're going to calculate it, but I've put it in the notes above and the examiner would be able to see that. So that would be OK there. 
And then I'm going to repeat this whole thing a couple more times so that I have three data points, all for 0.2 grams of magnesium and calculate a mean temperature change. Remember, there's basically never any credit given just for the idea of repeating. We need to talk about repeating and calculating a mean. And of course, we're taking the mean of the values for 0.2 grams of magnesium. We're not trying to work out one average for all the different masses. We're just trying to be really precise about, well, how big of a temperature change does 0.2 grams of magnesium cause? Then once we've done that, we can repeat the whole thing and we can talk about our control variables at this point. So we're going to have the same volume and the same concentration of copper sulfate solution. But now we're going to add these different masses of magnesium so we can see how that alters the temperature change. Now, this as a method would work. This is all valid. This would give me good data. So this would be enough to get me the six marks. But you might have included a couple of other things as well, just because you've done this practical. And so, you know, some ways we can make it better. So, for instance, you might have included in there about the idea that you want to do all the reactions in a polystyrene cup. And it, you might have talked about having a lid on it. Now, that's good information. And I would encourage you to do that. But if we left that out, we would still get valid data. We'd have smaller temperature changes because some of the energy would dissipate into the surroundings, but we would still get temperature changes of different sizes. And so even if you've missed this out, it's OK. You can still have your six marks. And likewise, in an ideal world, we want to talk about stirring the reaction throughout so that it's homogenized. And that's also going to give us better data. But again, even if you didn't do that, we could still get valid data that would answer the question. So you can still have your six marks, even if you haven't included that one. But you do, of course, need to have included changing the independent variable, measuring the dependent variable, keeping the control variables the same and also um, talking about how you would calculate that temperature change in the first place. Tomorrow's question is another physics calculation. Remember, there's a link in the description below to all of this week's questions and also the playlist containing all of the rest of the videos in the series so far. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you back again tomorrow for the next part of the six mark challenge. If you have found this video useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE science revision videos coming soon.